Well, with less than a week to go until opening statements, the full jury has now been seated in Derek Chauvin's trial. The people who will convict or acquit him in the death of George Floyd. Lou Raguse begins our coverage tonight with how the final day of jury selection played out. The jury in the Derek Chauvin case includes 15 jurors for now, even though only 14 will hear the case because of COVID-19 social distancing space requirements in the courtroom. That 15th juror will be dismissed on Monday before opening statements begin, unless something happens to one of the first 14 jurors before then and he needs to replace them. The 14 jurors include two alternates. Those two alternates will be dismissed at the end of the case before deliberations begin. The alternates don't know who they are yet. Opening statements start at 9 a.m. on Monday. Well, continuing our team coverage tonight, Danny Spiewak is live at the courthouse looking into who makes up this jury and what that could mean. Danny? Well, Julie, obviously we don't know the names of the jurors because that information is not publicly released right now, but we do have some background information, just some basic details that we've gotten as we've been watching over the past couple of weeks. And we went to legal experts tonight to tell us what they think of the demographics and makeup of the jury, what they think that might mean in the trial. Here's what we know about the 15 jurors chosen in the Chauvin trial. Nine are white and six are jurors of color, including four identifying as black. There are nine women and six men. They range in age from 20s to 60s. I guarantee you these lawyers are already sort of figuring out who's going to be the four person because that's the person that carries more weight in the jury room. Former U.S. Attorney Tom Heffelfinger says he's impressed with the demeanors of the chosen jurors. You want jurors who are going to pay attention. Uh, are going to get it and they're going to be able to discuss it fully. And I think they got that. All bring different life experiences to the room. There's a chemist, an auditor, a nonprofit executive, a social worker, even a nurse with cardiac experience. How do lawyers prepare now that they know who is sitting, sitting on the jury? Well, I don't think that their message in terms of their opening is going to depend on what kind of people they have sitting on the jury. I think it would have been the same message no matter who it was. The jurors will be instructed to decide based on the evidence. So the nurse, for example, cannot add her own medical expertise. During testimony, the jurors can't talk about the case with each other, explains Mike Padden, who is not involved in the Chauvin trial. So they'll, they'll probably engage in a lot of small talk and get to know each other somewhat. That interaction, though, is significant for who will eventually be chosen as the poor person, but that won't happen until the deliberations begin. Hmm. It's an important role. How do they decide who will be the four person of the jury, Danny? Well, Julie, usually there's a vote taken, like an internal vote that will decide who should be the leader, who's going to have to deliver the verdicts. Um, and that's, um, of course, something, as you heard from our legal expert, something that doesn't happen until deliberations are about to begin. And again, I just want to stress this for our audience, whether the verdict and the charges are guilty or not guilty, it has to be a unanimous decision by the jury. All right. Thank you, Danny. With a third degree murder charge re-added, this case became even more complicated. Lou is back to walk us through what the prosecution would need to prove for a conviction. In order to convict Derek Chauvin of second degree unintentional murder, also known as felony murder, prosecutors need to prove several elements of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt. First, they must prove Chauvin caused George Floyd's death, meaning Chauvin's knee on Floyd's neck was a substantial causal factor in causing Floyd to die, even if other causes contributed to his death. Then, prosecutors must prove that at the time of causing George Floyd's death, Chauvin was committing felony third-degree assault. That would mean Chauvin intentionally applied force to Floyd without his consent and that this physical act resulted in bodily harm. They don't have to prove that Chauvin intended to cause bodily harm. In order to prove Chauvin guilty of third-degree murder, they need to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Chauvin caused Floyd's death. Then, they need to prove Chauvin's intentional act that caused the death of George Floyd was eminently dangerous to other persons and was performed without regard for human life. They don't have to prove Chauvin intended to kill Floyd, but they must prove that he acted in a reckless or wanton manner with the knowledge that someone may be killed and with a heedless disregard of that happening. In order to prove second-degree manslaughter, prosecutors must prove Chauvin caused Floyd's death by culpable negligence. That's a phrase jurors will hear a lot. It means intentional conduct that Chauvin may not have meant to be harmful, but that a reasonable person would recognize as involving a strong probability of injury to others. They'll need to prove Chauvin created an unreasonable risk and consciously took a chance of causing death or great bodily harm. 
Well, be sure to stay with CARE 11 for all your trial coverage starting back up on Monday morning. We will broadcast the entire trial gavel to gavel on CARE 11 beginning at 9 a.m. every day. You can also watch our digital stream on care11.com or on the CARE 11 app.